This terrible encounter alarmed her to such a degree that for three years she lived in continual anxiety, hardly daring to stir out of doors even for her most urgent affairs and always dreading to see the ferocious Anatolian once more. From time to time she received letters from her husband who acquainted her with the movements of the French armies and his own advancement. In the later ones, he implored her to return to France, hoping soon to be able to rejoin her there. Having lost all hope of being reconciled to her family, Madame d'Artois concluded to do as her husband wished, and although the war between Russia and the Turks made the roads insecure, she left Constantinople in July 1809. After crossing Hungary and passing through the Austrian camps, Madame d'Artois turned toward Vienna, where she had the grief of learning at Graz that her husband had been mortally wounded at the Battle of Wagram. He was in that city, she was taken to him, and he breathed his last in her arms. She mourned her husband for a long time, but it was soon necessary to consider the future. The little money she had left on her departure from Constantinople had hardly sufficed for the expenses of her journey. Madame d'Artois had left nothing behind him. Several persons advised the poor woman to go to Schoenburg and seek assistance from His Majesty. A superior officer gave her a letter of recommendation to Monsieur Jalbert, the Emperor's interpreting secretary. Madame d'Artois arrived just as His Majesty was preparing to leave Schoenbrunn. She addressed herself to Monsieur Jalbert, the Duc de Bassano, General Lebrun, and several others who took a keen interest in her misfortunes. The Emperor, prized by the Duc de Bassano of the deplorable condition in which this lady found herself, instantly issued a special decree by which Madame d'Artois became entitled to an annual pension of 1,600 francs, the first year to be paid her in advance. When the Duc de Bassano came to tell the widow what his majesty had done for her, she fell at his knees and bedewed them with her tears. The emperor's birthday was celebrated at Vienna with much splendor. All the inhabitants felt obliged to illuminate their windows, and that produced a truly remarkable sight. There were no lanterns, but nearly all the windows being double-sashed, lamps and candles had been arranged very artistically between the two glasses, and the effect was charming. The Austrians seemed as gay as our soldiers. They would not have feted their own emperor with as much eagerness. There was doubtless something forced at the bottom of this unaccustomed mirth, but appearances betrayed nothing of it. The day before the fete during the parade, a terrible explosion was heard at Schoenbrunn. The noise seeming to come from the city. Some minutes later, a gendarme was seen galloping at a full speed. Oh, oh, said Colonel Mecknam, laughing. Vienna must be on fire. A gendarme galloping. He came to announce a very deplorable event. A company of artillery men were preparing in the city arsenal some fireworks to celebrate his majesty's birthday. One of them, in squeezing a bomb, set fire to the fuse. He was frightened and threw it away from him, and it lighted the powder contained in the workshop. Eighteen cannoneers were killed instantly and seven wounded. About the time of his majesty's fete, as I went into his cabinet one morning, I found with him Monsieur. Char Charles Sulmiter, Commissary General of the Viennese Police. I had already seen him several times. He had begun as first spy of the Emperor, and the trade had been so profitable that he now possessed an income of 40,000 livres. He was born at Strasbourg, where he had commenced by being the chief of the smugglers in Alsace, nature having marvelously organized him for that pursuit, as well as for that he afterwards followed. He said so himself when relating his adventures, and he claimed that there is much in common between smugglers and policemen, the great art of a smuggler being to know how to hide, and that of the detective to know how to find. He inspired such terror in the Viennese that he was worth a whole army corps for keeping them in order. His keen and penetrating glance, his air of resolution and severity, the abruptness of his gait and gestures, a terrible voice, and a vigorous appearance fully justified his reputation. His adventures would be a treasure trove to some romancer. During the first campaigns in Germany, being entrusted with a message from the French government to one of the most important personages of the Austrian army, he passed over to the enemy disguised as a German jeweler, duly provided with passports and supplied with a large quantity of diamonds and precious stones. He was betrayed, arrested, and searched. 
His letter was hidden in the double lining of a gold box. It was found, and the finder was stupid enough to read it aloud in his presence. Tried and condemned to death, he was handed over to the soldiers who were about to shoot him, but it was night, and his execution was deferred until the next day. Among his guards, he recognized a French deserter. He chatted with him and promised him plenty of money. He sent for wine, drank with the soldiers, made them drunk, put on one of their uniforms, and escaped with the Frenchman. But before returning to camp, he found meat to communicate with the person to whom the captured letter was addressed and acquaint him with its contents and what happened to him. The army was frequently given countersigns difficult to remember in order to fix attention more closely. One day, the word was Pericles Persopolis, a captain of the guard who knew the art of commanding a charge better than he did Greek history and geography, heard it badly and gave it out as Perse Liglis, Pierce the Church. There was a good deal of laughing over this quid pro quo. The old captain was by no means disturbed about it, saying that after all, he was not so far out of the way. The secretary of General Andrea C., governor of Vienna, had the unfortunate passion of gaming and finding that he did not win enough to meet his expenses he sold himself to the enemy his correspondence was seized he admitted his treason was condemned to death at the moment of execution he displayed astonishing coolness come nearer he said to the soldiers who were about to shoot him you will take better aim at me so i shall have to suffer less in one of his excursions around Vienna, the emperor met a very young conscript who was rejoining his corps. He stopped him and asked his name, his age, his regiment, and his country. Monsieur, replied the soldier who did not know him, my name is Martin. I am 17 years old and I come from the Upper Pyrenees. You are a Frenchman then? Yes, monsieur. Ah, you are a rogue of a Frenchman. Disarm this man, somebody, and hang him. Yes, I am a Frenchman, repeated the conscript, and long live the emperor. His majesty laughed a good deal. The conscript was undeceived, congratulated, and ran to rejoin his comrades with the promise of a recompense, a promise which the emperor was not slow to keep. Two or three days before his departure from Vienna, the emperor ran the risk of being assassinated. This time the blow was to have been struck by a woman, Countess M., attracted the notice of everybody at this period as much on account of her marvelous beauty as because of that scandal created by her liaison with Lord Peche, the English ambassador. It would not be easy to find expressions which would adequately describe the grace and charm of this lady to whom Viennese society opened its doors with a sort of repugnance, but who made herself amends for its contempt by receiving in her own house all that was most brilliant in the French army as army purveyor an army purveyor took it into his head to procure the acquaintance of this lady for the emperor and without informing his majesty he made propositions to the countess through one of his friends a cavalry officer attached to the military police of the city of vienna the cavalry officer believed himself to be speaking on behalf of the emperor and he said to the countess, in perfectly good faith that his majesty had the greatest desire to see her at Schoenbrunn. He gave this invitation one morning for that evening, which seemed a trifle abrupt for the countess, who would not decide at once, but asked for a day to think about it, adding that she would require indefeasible proofs that the emperor really had a hand in the matter. The officer protested his own sincerity, promised moreover to give every proof she could demand, and made an appointment with her for the evening. Having given an account of his negotiation to the purveyor. The latter gave the necessary orders for a carriage to be ready at the time indicated by the countess to the cavalry officer. At the hour appointed, the officer returned to her house, expecting to fetch her back with him. But she begged him to return the following day, saying that she had not yet decided and must have the night for still further reflection. The observations made by the officer induced her to accept, however, but only for the next day, and she gave him her word of honor to be ready at the hour when he should come to find her. The carriage, therefore, was sent away with orders to return the following day at the same hour. This time the envoy of the purveyor found the countess very well inclined. She received him gaily, even with alacrity, and made him notice that she had put all her affairs in order, as if she were contemplating some long journey. Then, after looking him full in the face for some moments, she sat thee and thouing him, 
Thou canst return in an hour. I will be ready. I will go to see him. Thou mayest count upon it. Yesterday I had business to arrange, but today I am at liberty. If thou art a good Austrian, thou wilt prove it to me. Thou knowest what harm he has done to our country. And well, this evening our country will be avenged. Come and get me. Don't fail. The cavalry officer, frightened by such a confidence, would not bear the responsibility of it. He came to the castle and told the whole. The emperor richly rewarded him, made him promise in his own interest not to see the countess again, and expressly forbade him to let the affair go any further. All these dangers did not produce the least alteration in his temper. He was accustomed to say, What have I to fear? I cannot be assassinated. I shall die nowhere but on the field of battle. And even on the battlefield, he took no precautions whatever. At Essling, for example, he exposed himself like a chief of battalion who wishes to become a colonel. Bullets killed men besides behind and in front of him. He never budged. This went so far that a frightened general exclaimed, Sire, if your majesty does not withdraw, I shall be obliged to have you taken away by my grenadiers. Judged by that whether the emperor dreamed of taking precautions for himself. But the signs of exasperation manifested by the inhabitants of Vienna made him watch over the safety of his troops. He had expressly forbidden the soldiers to leave their cantonments in the evening. His majesty was alarmed for them. The castle of Schoenbrunn was the rendezvous of all the illustrious savants of Germany. Not a new work was brought out, not a curious invention made its appearance, but the emperor at once gave orders to have their authors presented to him. It was thus that Monsieur Maisel, the famous mechanician who invented the metronome, was admitted to the honor of offering his majesty several pieces of his invention. The emperor admired the artificial legs intended to replace better and more commodiously than wooden ones those that had been torn away by the ball. He commissioned him to construct a car to convey the wounded from the field of battle. This car was to be made in such a way that, on being folded up, it could easily take in behind the mounted men in the train of the army, such as surgeons, aides, employees, ETC. Mr. Maisel had also constructed an automaton known all over Europe as the chess player. He brought it to Schoenbrunn to show it to his majesty and set it up in the apartment of the prince de Neuchâtel. The emperor went there and I followed him with several other persons. The automaton was seated in front of a table on which a chessboard was arranged for a game. His majesty took a chair and sitting down opposite the automaton said laughing, Come on comrade, here's to us too. The automaton saluted and made a sign with the hand to the emperor as if to bid him begin. The game opened. The emperor made two or three moves and intentionally a false one. The automaton bowed, took up the piece and put it back in its place. His majesty cheated a second time. The automaton saluted again but confiscated the piece. That is right, said his majesty and cheated the third time. Then the automaton shook its head and passing its hand over the chessboard. It upset the whole game. The emperor complimented the mechanician highly as he left the apartment accompanied by Prince de Neuchâtel. We fed in the antechamber two young girls who presented the prince on behalf of their mother with a basket of magnificent fruit. As the prince received them with an air of familiarity, the emperor, curious to know who they were, approached and questioned them, but they did not understand French. Someone told his majesty that these two pretty girls were the daughters of a good woman whose life had been saved by Marshal Berthier in 1805. He was right alone on horseback. The cold was horrible, and the ground covered with snow. He saw a woman lying at the foot of a tree, apparently in a dying condition. She was nearly frozen. The marshal took her in his arms, placed her on his horse, covered her with his cloak, and brought her back in this way to her daughters, who were at home crying over her absence. He went away without having made himself known, but they recognized him at the time Vienna was taken, and every week the two sisters came to see their benefactor, bringing him baskets of fruit or flowers in token of their gratitude. Chapter 10. Toward the end of September, the emperor made a journey to Rob. He was about to mount his horse to return to the residence of Schoenbrunn when he perceived the bishop of Rob at a little distance. Is that not the bishop? He said to Monsieur Jardin, who was holding his horse's head. No, sire, it's Suleiman. 
I ask you if that is not the bishop, repeated his majesty, pointing at the prelate. Monsieur Jardin, wholly intent on his own business and thinking nothing but one of the emperor's horses, which was called the bishop, answered, Sire, I assure you that you wrote him the last relay but one. The emperor perceived his mistake and shouted with laughter at Vagram, I witnessed a trait which attests all the bounty and sensibility of the emperor, of which I think I have given several proofs already. For if, in the story I'm going to tell, he was compelled to deny himself an act of clemency, even his refusal brings out his admirable generosity and strength of soul. A very wealthy lady living near Cayenne, Madame de Combray handed over her chateau to a band of royalists who can considered themselves to be serving their cause worthily by plundering stagecoaches on the high roads. She acted as treasurer to this body of partisans and passed over the funds to a pretended treasurer of Louis the Eighteenth. Her daughter, Madame Aquet, joined the band dressed like a man and distinguished herself by her audacity. But their exploits were not of long duration, pursued and seized by superior forces. They were brought to trial, and Madame Aquet was condemned to death along with her accomplices. She feigned pregnancy and obtained a reprieve, during which she tried every possible means to secure her pardon, but in vain. Finally, after eight months of useless solicitations, she determined to send her children to Germany to ask it from the emperor in person. Her physician, her sister, and her two daughters arrived at Schoenbrunn. That day, the emperor was about to visit the field of Agram. All day long, on the front steps of the palace, they awaited his return. The two children, one of whom was ten years old and the other twelve, inspired much interest, but their mother's crime was frightful for if in politics no opinion as such is guilty still under whatever government those should be punished who for opinion's sake become robbers and assassins the children dressed in mourning threw themselves at the feet of the emperor crying pardon pardon give us back our mother the emperor raised them kindly took the petition from their hands and their aunt read the whole of it attentively questioning the physician with interest looked at the children hesitated but at the moment when i thought as everyone did who was present at this touching scene that he was about to pronounce the pardon he drew back hastily saying i cannot do it i had seen the interior combat he was going through several times he had changed color his eyes were swimming in tears his voice was changed his refusal seemed to me an act of courage close beside the souvenir of these acts of criminal violence all the more to be condemned perhaps because they proceeded from a woman who in order to commit them must first have spurned the gentleness and modest virtues of her sex i find in my notes a trait of fidelity and conjugal affection which might have merited a better fate the wife of a general of infantry would never quit her husband while the army was on the march she followed the regiment in an open carriage when there was fighting going on she mounted a horse and kept as close as possible to the line at friedland she saw the colonel fall pierced by a bullet she ran to him with her servant carried him out of the ranks herself and brought him to the ambulance but it was too late he was dead her grief was silent no one beheld her shed a tear she offered her purse to a surgeon and besought him to embalm her husband's body the operation was performed as well as possible the corpse wrapped in cloths was put into a hinged casket and placed in her carriage the despairing widow sat down beside it and resumed the road to france but her supposed grief soon deprived her of reason at every station, she would shut herself up with her precious charge, draw the body from the casket, place it on a bed, uncover the face, lavish on it. The tenderest caresses talked to it as if it were still living and sleep beside it. In the morning, she would replace her husband in the casket and continue on her way in dismal silence. Her secret was undiscovered for several days, but it was disclosed a few days before she arrived in Paris. The embalmment had not been performed in such a manner as to guarantee the body from putrefaction for a long period. This advanced to such a point that the frightful odor exhaled from the casket awakened suspicions. In an inn where she was stopping in the evening, the room of this unhappy wife was entered and she was found holding in her arms a horribly disfigured body of her husband silence she cried to the terror-stricken and keeping my husband is asleep why do you come to disturb his glorious slumber they had had hard work to extricate the corpse 
from the embrace of this mad woman and to conduct her to Paris, where she soon died without having regained her reason. I was much surprised to visit at Schoenbrunn at the non-appearance there of the Archduke Charles, whom we knew to be greatly esteemed by the Emperor, who never mentioned him, but in terms expressive of the highest consideration, I am entirely ignorant of the motives which prevented this prince from coming to Schoenbrunn or the Emperor from receiving him there. However that may be, two or three previous to the departure for Munich, His Majesty left the castle one morning for a hut with several officers and me, and had us halt at a meet called the Venery, on the road from Vienna to Bukestorf. On arriving, we found the Archduke Charles, who was awaiting his majesty with only two members of his suite, the sovereign, and the Archduke remained shut up in the pavilion for a long time, and it was very late when we returned to Schoenbrunn. The emperor departed from this residence at noon, October 16th. His Majesty's suite included Grand Marshal Duc de Friol, Generals Rapp, Mouton, Savarine and Soutit, Duronel, Lebrun, and three lieutenants and chamberlains. Monsieur Labbe, head of the Topographic Bureau, Monsieur de Meneval, His Majesty's secretary, and Monsieur Ivan, the Duc de Bassano, and the Duc de Cadour, the Minister of External Relations, left with us. We reached Passau in the morning of the 18th. The emperor spent the entire day in visiting forts Maximilian and Napoleon, and seven or eight redoubts whose names recalled the principal events of the campaign. More than 12,000 men were at work on these important constructions. His Majesty's visit was a fete for all these honest people. In the evening, we set out again, and two days later, we were in Munich at Augsburg. As he was coming out of the palace of the Elector of Treves, the Emperor saw a woman surrounded by four children kneeling in the street where he would be obliged to pass her. He raised her and kindly inquired what he could do for her. Without speaking, the poor woman handed to his majesty a, a petition written in German, which General Rapp translated. She was the widow of a German physician named Butting, recently the deceased, who was known to the army for his zeal in assisting wounded Frenchmen when they happened to come his way. The elector of Treves and several members of the emperor's suite earnestly supported the petition of Madame Butting, whom the death of her husband had well nigh reduced to poverty and who asked his majesty for some assistance for the children of the German physician whose exertions had saved the lives of several of his brave soldiers. His majesty ordered the first yearly installment of a pension to which he instantly entitled her to be paid to his petitioner on the spot, General Rapp having apprised the widow of what the emperor had done for her. She uttered a cry of joy and fainted. I was witness of another scene equally affecting. When the emperor was marching on Vienna, the inhabitants of Augsburg, who had conducted themselves badly towards the Bavarians, were trembling lest his majesty should resort to terrible reprisals. Their terror was at its height when it was learned that a part of the French army was to pass through the city. A young woman of remarkable beauty, who had been a widow for some months, had retired thither with her child, hoping to be more quiet there than elsewhere. Alarmed at the approach of the troops, she took her child in her arms and fled, but instead of avoiding our soldiers, she took a wrong gate and fell into the midst of the French outposts. General de Curb saw her trembling, distraught, and conjuring him to save her honor, even at the expense of her life. She fainted, affected to tears. The general lavished attentions on her and gave her a safe conduct and an escort to accompany her to a neighboring city where she said she had several relatives. The order to march was given at the same moment and in the movements which it entailed. The child was forgotten when the mother was removed and it remained with the outposts. An honest grenadier took it and inquiring where the poor mother had been taken, he promised himself to give it back to her as soon as possible. Providing that a ball did not take him off before the return of the army, he had a leather pocket made in which he carried his young protege under the shelter of his knapsack. Whenever he had to fight, the good grenadier made a hole in the ground, put the little one in it, and came for it again after the affair was over. His comrades jeered at him the first day, but they were not slow to comprehend the beauty of this action. The child escaped every danger thanks to the continual cares of its adoptive father. And when they set out on the road to Munich, the grenadier, who had become singularly attached to the poor little thing, almost regretted 
that the moment was approaching when he must restore it to his mother. It is easy to comprehend what this unfortunate creature must have suffered after losing her child. She begged, she entreated the soldiers escorting her to retrace their steps, but they had orders and nothing could induce them to infringe them. Hardly had she reached her place of destination when she returned to Augsburg and made inquiries in all directions. No one could give her any information. She believed her son was dead and bitterly deplored him. She had been mourning thus for nearly six months when the army again passed through Augsburg. She was at work in her room when someone came to tell her that a soldier was asking to see her, that he had something precious to return to her, but that, as he could not leave his court, he begged her to come and find him on the place. Not dreaming of such a happiness, she came and asked for the grenadier. The latter quitted his rank and taking the little man out of his knapsack, he put him into the arms of his mother, who could not believe the testimony of her own eyes, thinking that perhaps this lady was not rich. This excellent man had made a collection amounting to 25 louis, which he had placed in one of the little fellow's pockets. The emperor remained only a short time at Munich. On the day of his arrival, a courier was dispatched by the Grand Marshal to Monsieur de Lusay to apprise him that his majesty would be at Fontainebleau, the 27th of October, probably in the evening, and that his household and that of the empress must be at that residence to receive his majesty. But instead of arriving on the 27th, the emperor traveled with such rapidity that he was at the gate of the palace of Fontainebleau by 10 o'clock in the morning, October 26th, so that with the exception of the Grand Marshal, a courier, and the concierge of Fontainebleau, he found no one to receive him when he alighted from his carriage. This very natural disappointment, since nobody could foresee that he would be a day ahead of time, put the emperor in a very bad humor. He looked all around as if searching for somebody to scold, and seeing that the courier was about to descend from his horse, on which he was rather glued than seated, he said to him, Rest yourself tomorrow, hasten to St. Clue, and announce my arrival. And the poor courier galloped off again in the finest style. The fault which dissatisfied his majesty so keenly could not be attributed by him to any person, for by orders of the Grand Marshal, which was that of the Emperor, Monsieur de Lucet had commanded the attendants of their majesties to be in readiness early the next morning. It was therefore that evening as soon as that they could arrive it was necessary to wait till then meanwhile the emperor began to visit the new apartments which he had built in the chateau the building in the court of the cheval blanc formerly used by the military school had been restored enlarged and decorated with extraordinary magnificence it had been entirely converted into apartments of honor in order said his majesty to give employment to the manufactories of lyon which had been deprived of their foreign markets by the war. After having gone round and round them, the emperor sat down, exhibiting signs of the greatest impatience. He was constantly inquiring what time it was, or else looking at his watch. At last he ordered me to get ready what he needed for writing, and sat down at a small table quite alone, inwardly swearing, no doubt, at his secretaries who did not come. At five o'clock, there came a carriage to St. Clue. The emperor, hearing a roll into the court, ran down precipitately, and while a footman opened the door and let down the steps, he said to the persons inside, and the empress? They replied that her majesty, the empress, had dispatched them not more than a quarter an hour ahead of her. That is very lucky, returned the emperor, and turning around abruptly, he went upstairs again to the small library where he had begun his work. At last, the empress arrived just as it was about time to strike six, and it was quite dark. This time, the emperor did not go down. He inquired what... It was he heard, and learning that her majesty had come, he kept on writing without disturbing himself to go and receive her. It was the first time he had acted thus. The empress found him sitting in his library. Ah, said his majesty, there you are, madame, you do well, for I was just about to go to St. Clue. And the emperor, who had lifted his eyes from his work to fix them on the empress, lowered them again, and he finished speaking. This severe reception wounded Josephine greatly. She tried to excuse herself. His majesty responded in a way that brought tears to her eyes, but he speedily repented and begged her pardon, acknowledging that he was in the wrong. Chapter 11. It was not, as has been said in certain memoirs, on account of and subsequently to the trifling quarrel, I have just described that his majesty first conceived the idea of a divorce. 
The emperor believed it needful for the welfare of France that he should have an heir to his name, and as the emperors could no longer hope to give him one, he must have contemplated a divorce. But it was by the gentlest means and with the utmost consideration that he sought to lead the empress to this painful sacrifice. He did not resort, as some would have us understand, to threats and fits of passion. It was to his wife's reason that he appealed, and she consented voluntarily. I repeat it. There was no violence on the part of the emperor. There was courage, resignation, and submission on that of the empress. Her devotion to the emperor would have made her consent to every sacrifice. She would have given her life for him, and although this terrible separation broke her heart, she derived some consolation from the idea that she could spare the man she cherished above all others and in quietude a torment. And when she heard that the king of Rome was born, she forgot all of her grief in order to think of nothing but the happiness of her friend, for they never ceased to entertain for each other feelings of the most perfect friendship. The emperor had taken nothing all day long on the 26th but a cup of chocolate and a little broth. Hence, I had heard him complain of hunger several times before the empress arrived. The quarrel over, the couple embraced each other affectionately, and the empress passed on into her apartments to make her toilet. While this was going on, the emperor received Monsieur de Cray and de Montalivet, whom he had sent a groom to look for in the morning, and at half past seven, the empress reappeared, dressed in perfect taste, in spite of the cold. She had no headdress, but silver wheat ears and blue flowers, and she wore a white satin polonaise border with swans down, which was admirably becoming. The emperor interrupted his work to look at her. I was not very long at my toilette, was I? said she, smiling. Without answering, his majesty pointed to the clock, then rose, and giving her his hand, said to Messieurs de Montalivet and de Cray, as he was about to enter the dining room, I will be with you in five minutes. But, said the emperor, these gentlemen have probably not dined, since they have just come from Paris. Ah, that is true. And the ministers went with their majesties into the dining room, where they ate nothing since the emperor had scarcely seated himself when he got up again, threw down his napkin, and returned to his study, where these gentlemen necessarily followed him, but, I think, to their extreme regret. The day ended better than it began. In the evening, there was a reception, not very large, but very agreeable, at which the emperor showed himself very gay and amiable. He seemed anxious to efface the recollection of the little scene he had had with the empress.